Uh, my name is Fadil Santosa. I'm the director of the IMA. I'm, I'm okay. That, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Ingrid Dobashi, who will be lecturing tonight. Uh, Professor Dobashi received her PhD in 1980 in physics from the Free University of Brussels. Um, only four years later, she received a, a very prestigious prize, the Louis M. Pomp Prize in Physics, which was awarded every five years to uh, Belgian scientists uh, who, who, on work done before the age of 29. In 1987, she joined uh, AT&T Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. It was about that time when, we started, when she started to uh, become engaged in uh, wavelets. She was a professor at Rutgers for two years before settling down to a current position at Princeton University. Actually, I met Ingrid um, at Rutgers during my sabbatical, and I actually sat on her class on wavelets. It was a very exciting time, a, a very exciting class. The book, uh, 10 Lectures on Wavelet, on which the class is based, um, became a, the, the best-selling book published by the Society uh, for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And uh, that book also led her to, uh, to receiving the American Math Society Steel Prize in 1994. Uh, speaking of uh, awards and recognition, she has received many. Among them is the prestigious MacArthur uh, Fellowship, which is also often referred to in the, in the public press as the Genius Award. It's, uh, if, you, if you don't know about it, it's a one, uh, half million dollar award with no strings attached, given to, uh, using their words, talented individuals who have shown extraordinary or, or, originality and dedication in their creative pursuits. She was elected member of the National Academy of Science in 1998, and the National Academy also awarded her the prize in mathematics in 2000. The citation reads, for fundamental discoveries on wavelets and her role in making wavelets methods a practical basic tool. She's also received many international recognitions, including honorary degrees and memberships in science academies abroad. Because of the breadth uh, and uh, the, of the impact of her work, she's been recognized in other fields, including uh, the IEEE Information Theory Society, which awarded her the Golden Jubilee Award for Technological Innovations. She's also an innovator in education. She teaches a very popular course at Princeton called Math Alive. There's a really lovely web page about this course. It's a course that takes uh, a non-math major through uh, examples. The, uh, it teaches them the, the role the mathematics play in their daily life. In the process, the students uh, experience and appreciate the power and beauty of mathematics. So tonight's lecture is going to be on uh, serving, on, serving with wavelets. And uh, please give a warm welcome to Professor Dobshu. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, hope, I hope we will do a little bit of uh, surfing uh, with wavelets. I mean, surfing over a couple of applications surfing of, uh, about uh, over a little bit of their mathematical meaning. And I thought, uh, 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 actually last week, I happened to be in Amsterdam in uh, the museum, the Van Gogh Museum. I mean, well, it's Van Gogh is the way he would have said it. You probably know it as Van Gogh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, so in the, in, in, and uh, where we were working on a workshop that was bringing together people in image analysis and art historians to show them that image analysis could contribute something to, uh, uh, to, to, conservators, to cons art conservators and art historians. And so I thought I would start our surfing with a slide that I used there. I mean, so this is on the left, a wavelet transform, and we will build up slowly the image on the right by using more and more of the information on the left. So let's look at it. and you started to recognize it. And another neat thing I can do with this is I could use the information that I have at this stage and then separately put the information that I still need to add to it to get the full thing. So let's look at that. That's these two things. So you have decomposed it into something that gives you the subject and something that gives you all the fine details. And that was just to give you an idea 
of things we can do with wavelets. I mean, uh, I'd like to explain now a little bit how we can do that. So uh, for that, I'll uh, switch to a different talk. Oh, shoot. That's not what I wanted to do. The resolution is, I have to drag things from over there. My screen goes to here, you see. And uh, um, so, okay, back to the, the start. And um, let me give you a little, oh shoot, uh, video mute. Is this it? Yes, fine. So let me explain to you a little bit about how a wavelet transform can work. So basically, I mean, we had these images. Images consist of pixels. Pixels are little squares that have a certain, if you look at black and white, certain gray level. Gray levels typically go from zero to 255, from completely black to completely white. If you have color, then you have the same thing in red, green, and blue. But uh, so we have different numbers for these different pixels. So an image from a mathematical point of view as if you want to do image analysis, is just an enormous field of numbers arranged on a square array. Okay, so let's take one line out of the image. Then I just have one line of pixels. So one line of numbers. And as mathematicians, as soon as we get something, we like to make graphs of it. So I can make a graph of it, and I can imagine, typically an image looks a lot like this, and then it has certain, and then it has stuff like this, and then things like this, and, and so on. So this would be a sudden transition from something very light to something much darker. Well, you can imagine, this is not a natural scene here, but you can imagine taking a snapshot here and you would definitely get places where sharper, sharp lines, sharp transitions exist between darker and lighter. And you have regions where shading, I mean, on the screen you see it nicely. I mean, you go from light to slightly darker. So you have shading that slowly happens. You can have, uh, uh, things that are oscillating, like the wall there, or like the ceiling there would actually have oscillations that look more like, like this. And uh, you can have also a sudden line. I mean, this black line here at the edge of the screen would, would actually occur like a line like this, because it's a dark line and low numbers are black. In any case, we have something that you can sketch as a function, the graph of a function with smooth and sudden variations. Now. Okay, if we blow this up because we know that we are discrete, what we're really plotting here are just levels. I mean, let's, 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 let's give a certain width to the pixel and let's imagine that we have a piecewise, that we have the constant level in each pixel. So, I mean, of course, this goes on from there to there in order to describe my simple image, one line out of my simple image. But I'm going to view this in a kind of hierarchical way. I want to distinguish, just like we saw in the Im image that I, I gave at the start, we were seeing overall features, and then we were zooming more and more on detail. So we had peeled it apart into very fine detail, coarser detail, and so on. So let me show you a very, very simple way of doing that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to group these pixels in groups of two two over time, and I'm going to compute for each of the two their average. I mean, can't be harder than that. I mean, I once had to explain this to somebody who was uh, uh, doing, uh, doing a little interview for, for uh, a local public television. I said, oh my God, mathematics, I mean. I said, well, come on. He says, uh, uh, an average. I said, uh, yes, he says, averages he could still do. Okay, so uh, we're taking averages. Now, if I, if I then look at, at, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to replace the original black thing by these averages, which are twice as wide. And of course, I've made a mistake. I mean, the original levels were not at those averages. And what is the mistake I've made? Well, I had to go a bit lower here and a little higher. So that's this mistake. And then here, I have a tiny little mistake. So a tiny little bit lower, a tiny little bit higher, and so on. And so you see that for every little block, I have a kind of up and down oscillation. And at some later point where uh, I'm, I'm going down the other direction, for instance, if I blow this up, I will have something like this. Then if I start to compute averages there, 
horizontally, then of course the mistake I've made will be an up and down, but now in a different direction. So all these, the, the, what I've, I've done when I replace the original fine scale with all its riches of detail by this green super pixels, if you want, is something that I can depict completely by uh, just taking this, this kind of elementary building block. I mean, and I'm drawing this for facility. It's really something that's zero here, one here, then minus one here and zero again with, with little dots here. The, the, the vertical lines are not in the graph. I take this, I make it very, very narrow because remember I'm at a very tiny scale. I make, give it the right amplitude. I have different weights for it here or there or there and I put them in the appropriate spots. But so this one building block, and I make it negative if I need to, like here, and sometimes it's positive, like here. So this one building block suffices to express completely the difference between the original and this green coarser version. Okay, so that's the, my fine scale detail, and in these tiny little Lego blocks, these up and down things. Now, there's nothing that prevents me from continuing I mean, after I've, so I, I've decomposed my original. I have, so I had an original, and I decompose it into averages and fine detail. And then what I can do is I can put the fine detail on the side, that's one layer, but the averages are going to look exactly like my original thing did except at a coarser scale. So I can just repeat the whole argument there. I can repeat the whole construction and take averages of them in groups of two. And again, look at the differences. The difference here that I've made is something that looks like this and so on. And again, I see that I have layers, but now of things that are twice as wide. And so once you see this happening, you can imagine yourself, I mean, I always have this mental picture of, of, of peeling off layers of an onion. I mean, you peel off a layer of detail and then more detail and so on, layer after layer after layer. And that's what was happening in, 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 the, in, in, in the example that I gave you. There's one difference. I mean, here I'm talking about lines. And pictures, of course, are not lines. They're two-dimensional. So, well, we'll have to do it in two dimensions. Let's imagine doing it in two dimensions. Um, so I start with my picture. My picture is big like that. And it has a whole lot of, 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 of rows and columns. And then what in each row, each row of, of, of let's say, 1,024, uh, uh, pixels, I can split into half of that number in averages and half that number in differences. And I do that for each row and I put all the rows below each other and so what I will get is something that has not been treated in vertically but it has been treated horizontally and so I represent that in this way by still being black here but Okay, now I have in horizontally, I've peeled off coarse things from detail. I can do the same thing vertically. And if I do that, then I will have, I mean here, I have to represent it in averages and differences. And I have to do the same on the other columns. So again, I get averages and differences. And so now you see that I have four blocks in all. Blocks that came from horizontal averaging and then averaging or differencing vertically and blocks that came from horizontal differencing and so on. And so what we do is we try to, we, we shove these four together and that gives you, and that's actually an explanation of what you saw in the, uh, on the poster. I mean, let me turn off this light for a moment. And I've been coached in this, you see. I mean, but maybe not well enough. Uh, uh, okay, so, woof, lamp. Lamp, I'm hitting lamp. Ah, ah okay. 
it says wait. We're waiting. Okay. So is that focused? Okay. So on the poster, you had, uh, this was actually one big picture that had been decomposed into three layers. And here at the top, you had the averages both direction. This is this, this, this weird funky building across from the IMA. I mean, it's all in metal. And, and is it a Gary building? It looks like a Gary building. It's a Gary building. I mean, uh, we have our own, so it's also weird. And, uh, uh, so we have, and, and what you see is these are the three different images. You see that here, horizontal lines stand out. And why do they stand out? Because horizontal lines are things that you see when you make a vertical difference in. I mean, and a horizontal averaging, horizontal averaging will say, oh, yeah, it looks the same, I don't care. But when you make a vertical difference, it says, oops, there's a, a change here. Something is happening. And so if I look back at what I had drawn here, I think we may be... So this is a vertical difference and a horizontal averaging. Then if you difference in the other direction, so I make horizontal differencing and vertical averaging. Horizontal differencing, differencing in this direction, is going to give me a big number, a big, a big, it says, oops, something's happening when I go from very dark to very white there. So when I have a vertical line, a vertical transition will show up in horizontal differencing. And indeed, you see that vertical features stand out. And then, well, here you have diagonal features mostly that stand out because you've differenced in both directions. So that's an explanation of that poster. So let's go back to here. Ah. OK, I don't know how to. I want to go back to black screen. Ah, that's what I tried. OK. I'll have to come back and uh, show that I can do better next time. Uh, Okay, so this is the explanation. But then, of course, just like we were doing in the one dimension, we're not going to stop. Now that we have got nice principle, we have here something that looks like the image, but smaller. Why stop there? We can do it again. And so when we do it again, we'll, on that green image, we'll do something where we do our differencing and averaging in, on that small one, and that gives even smaller arrays. And the other ones we keep. So the other ones we just put around it, and so on. I mean, uh, so here, all the blue, and so on. And of course, I will keep going like this as, 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 as long as I, 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 am I have the patience to do it. And uh, so we can replace this again, and so on. And that's what I was doing in this Van Gogh example. In the Van Gogh example, I was showing you that, uh, I mean, I was going from five levels down and I was building it up gradually. And as I was building up gradually, what I was doing was I was building up first from only that information. I mean, I can go back from there. I could say, look, suppose that all these other things had given me nothing. There was no difference. There was no fine detail. Then you blow it up again and you get something very, very fuzzy. And then you add a detail and you add a detail. So I can do that and that's what I was showing you. So let me show you another example. Uh, Okay. Here, it's a little less, less, less uh, appealing maybe than, than the Van Gogh picture. We have a boat. This is just to show you that it doesn't have to be, to be square. This is if I average in both directions. And here are the three difference images. The convention here is slightly different from what you saw on the poster image. Here, because I was also wanting to show uh, uh, positive and negative. You see, if you take the difference, the, the, the original gray levels are, are black and white, are, are gray levels. They're all positive. But if you take differences of two positive numbers, you can end up with a positive or a negative number. And so gray in the difference images stands for zero. And black stands for very large and negative, and white for very large and positive, except the white doesn't show. But I mean, uh, very well. But so you see that you have horizontal lines standing out where we have done the vertical differencing on the lower left, and vertical lines standing out where we did the horizontal differencing. And I can go further. I mean, for the average thing, I can do the decomposition again, and I have to keep all the other information. I can, on that smaller average, do it again. 
and add all the other information. And again, and add all the, and again, yes. Okay, I think that's it, yes. Okay, so now we're going to do the reconstruction here that we had seen with the Van Gogh picture. So I'm taking only the thing in the, that, that little top left square and reconstruct, and I'm adding in the details. Okay, so we're going to look at that again. Going to look at that again at a, uh, uh, for a, a, we're going to concentrate on two pieces of, of, the, uh, of, of the picture. One is in the sky and the other is in the sail. And on the, the, we'll see the originals on the left and on the right. We see now the very, very coarse approximations. And I'll go through it twice. First time I'd like you to concentrate on the sky and see from when on you consider that the sky is already good. Probably people at the back consider it good already now. People at the front probably find it a bit washed out. But the sail, everybody agrees, is not there yet. So I'm adding detail, more detail. Even from this close, I, I, I couldn't say at the last transition whether the sail improved. I mean, so I don't expect that you could. But, okay. So the sail was ready much sooner than the, uh, uh, than, than the, uh, uh, the, the, the sail was uh, ready much later than the sky was. So let's, let's see why that is. Well, first I have to confess you something. The difference thing that, and averaging that I was doing before is really morally what happens. But in practice, we are a little bit smarter than that. We do something a little bit smarter because you see, what we want is the detail to capture detail, interesting stuff. And uh, if I just did inter uh, averaging and differencing, then indeed, if there was nothing happening, if all my pixels, if all my numbers were the same, then indeed I didn't have to add detail. Taking the average of this, if I have little pixels that do things like this, or I replace them by their averages, I mean, it's exactly the same, so the difference is going to be zero. But if I have something where the pixels just become, where I have a constant becoming lighter, I mean, so just a linear progression of light, of, of, of light then I will have a similar linear progression of light in my averages, but I have made mistakes. I have to constantly adjust now to, I have to, well, I made a little mistake. I was, I was a little bit too high here and a little bit too low. And so, so, I mean, my differences will look like that. You say, well, so you, that's how you define the game. Well, but I'd like to define the game so that if a piece of my image is so boring that I could describe it with just uh, two words on the telephone, that I don't waste mathematics on it when I try to decompose it. So, I mean, I don't want to have all these coefficients here. So what that means is that I have to find a smarter way of computing averages and differencing. And there are ways of doing that. What you can do is you can just say, look, I mean, what this is helping me to do is, from the green stuff, predict what the black stuff would have been if I had kept all the information. Well, there are smarter ways of predicting. I can predict in a way by saying, look, if, if I have green stuff like that and it progresses nice, nicely, uh, it, it, it progresses in a nice way, then I would predict things halfway in between and I would uh, get the black stuff. So we do uh, fancier averaging and differencing than, uh, than what I showed you. Uh, what it really does is it, it, it will do perfectly as long as you have a low order polynomial. So I had constant, Linears. Typically, you do. You try to use uh, uh, schemes that will do well up to to cubics or so. So, as long as things behave in a nicely predictable way, the, diff the details are not needed. The averages take uh, already take that into account. So, that's one thing. And then a consequence of that is that when I start decomposing, suppose I have a very sudden transition, or I have something that has a cusp or I have something that's very smooth. Then what happens is, and you have nice mathematical theorems to actually prove that, that you see here, I mean, regardless what the average is going to be, it's going to be very hard to predict that I'm going to have a sudden transition. I mean, so you will have to pay for this. 
In order to really reconstruct this well, you will need wavelet uh, uh, coefficients that if you go to finer and finer scales, that will, I mean, they will not, I mean, they will remain large. The amplitudes of the differences will remain large. If I go at a place where I have here, so now I use the color to indicate different regions, not, 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 not differences or averages anymore. So in this region, where the function is continuous, so at least it's not going all of a sudden from white to black, but it was nicely increasing, and then all of a sudden it reverses itself completely. That is something that stands out, like a ridge, like a fold. If you have pages of a book and they fold, I mean, the way you see that fold, that darker fold in between is exactly something like this, except in reverse. But uh, so this will also need fine scales, but not quite as bad as before. So the finer scales, I, 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 I will go down quicker than there. And in places where I'm really nice and smooth, you see, if I do something like this, a third order polynomial catches that perfectly. That means that my details at fine scales will just be zero. So in a region like this, I will find that my wavelet coefficients, I mean, as I go to finer scales, I just don't need them at all. So what that means is that, of course, in practice, you don't keep numbers. Depending on the application, you may not keep numbers that are smaller than, let's say, a thousandth for images, for instance, or then 10 to the minus 6 if you want to do computation, or 10 to the minus 20 if you want to do uh, uh, incredibly accurate computation or to show, want to show off to, 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 to other numerical analysts. Um, so we will put a cutoff, and meaning that below that number we don't need to keep things, and that will tell us the finest scale at which we need to go in order to see something. And you see here I need almost nothing at all. Here. I need some scales, and here I need all the scales. And that's what was happening in, in uh, let's, let's, let's see again. So, so I was very smooth, and as I go smooth, so I go down, and you see in the sky I had not much detail, so I wasn't necessary. Oh, sorry, I, I uh, sorry. We'll go back, I'll, you'll show it again. I'll show you again what I saw here. Uh, so we have uh, in the sky where it's very smooth, you see not much detail, the co detail coefficients are very small, I don't need them. In the sail where things are not smooth at all, especially around the letters, I need all the detail in order to make that really sharp. Okay. Now, we've seen these compression slides uh, a couple of times, so let's go talk about compression. So this, you can use this for compression, of course, because what it means is that I'm not going to waste energy on storing those, co th those details. Places where detail is zero, I can forget about it. Now, uh, that is, uh, so if I have this, 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 uh, this boat image and on the right a transform, I could take things that are just above a certain threshold, stuff that I've painted red on the right, and that means that I have retained about a 30th of the original information, and I still get reconstruction on the left. Now, it's not perfect, so I'll toggle back and forth between the original and this is original, this is, uh, so, original. You see, it's not perfect, especially in the numbers, you saw a difference. But it's pretty good. I mean, if you consider that in the original picture, picture, I had eight bits of information for every pixel to give you the complete gray level. I've now reduced to about a 30 second of that information. That means that I have just about, if I hadn't been clever, enough information to tell you for four of those pixels whether it was black or white. I mean, yet if by being clever, I can get the image to this, pre to this precision. Okay, if I do a little bit more, then you have the image almost perfectly. So this can be used for compression, is used for compression. The JPEG 2000 standard uses uh, wavelets for compression, actually uses the smarter scheme that I have been used to make these pictures. It can also be used for many other things. I mean, we have our detail that is very, very tiny at fine scales. And as we go to coarser scales, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But that means that if you want to thumb quickly through an archive of images, 
and only look at core scales and then say, oh, this image, I want, and I don't even need the whole image, I just need this little bit of the image. You can very fast and, 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 and retrieve that little bit of information. I mean, you can imagine it for, for things like, uh, 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 typically this kind of, of, of technology is used for things like, like, like Google Earth applications and so on, where you, want, you have an enormous uh, data set and you want to retrieve only pieces of it. And you can do this in an interactive way. So this illustrated here on, on, on this boat image by the fact that I identify on this very coarse image that the region of the sail where the number will be, and I tell this to my data uh, structure. So I paint ahead of time. I tell them where to find the addresses of the region I want more of. And it, it, I've painted those in red on the right. And I'm only going to use those. I'm not calling back any others. And this is what I reconstruct. And so I can do part of it very sharply and not waste any energy on the rest. Ah, applications. The very first application in which uh, the, the wavelet compression was used was a, a, a standard for fingerprint compression by the FBI. This was in the, uh, oof, in the early 90s. Uh, the FBI at that time went over to digitization of their fingerprint uh, uh, collection. And they have, of course, an enormous collection of fingerprints, not only of, 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 of criminals and, 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 and suspects, but also of every single person who, uh, who immigrated to this country. I mean, one of the things you have to do is you have to get fingerprinted, as all of you who came as an immigrant <laughs> must remember. Uh, so uh, they had, I mean, the way they had at that point, so early 90s, they had still everything on paper, so on cards. I mean, you know these cards on which they roll your and so on, and then very dirty ink, and then you have to wash your hands and so on. But so they do this, and they put it on cards, and they had all these cards for everybody. And the way it worked is that, that they had 20 cards per folder and so many folders per drawer and so many drawers per cabinet and so many cabinets and so on. And this was the number of fingerprints they had was they could express an acreage, I mean, just of cabinets next to each other. So they had an enormous collection. And they wanted to digitize it and they wanted to compress it uh, once they were at it. And they wanted to compress it in such a way that after they decompressed it, they could still, with high reliability, recognize whether fingerprint, where two fingerprints were of the same person or not, with the same reliability as they could originally. So they had a very pragmatic way of, of expressing how good compression had to be. And so what they did is they wrote out a competition and they asked different teams to, uh, uh, to, to participate in different uh, uh, universities and, and industrial labs proposed uh, 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 algorithms to do this. And it was important for them that this could be done with an algorithm that was very simple so that it could be manufactured very simply and cheaply. Well, because they weren't really interested in, in only the most, uh, the, most, the most prosperous precincts being able to acquire this gadget and send their fingerprints. They wanted a cheap thing that everybody could buy easily and an easy standard. And uh, what happened is that this competition was won by uh, uh, something that was proposed by a, uh, a team in which Los Alamos participated. And uh, the standard was written by Chris Brislon at Los Alamos, who, who, who let me use the pictures that he used for, for that meeting. And uh, uh, what, did, what did win was a wavelet proposal. So here are, I mean, an, I mean uh, these are pictures from that time. So here is an uh, original, was an original fingerprint and a wavelet reconstruction of that fingerprint with a compression ratio of about 18, which is what I wanted. Now, you don't see much difference, but that's really not fair because, I mean, it's not fair that I ask you to, to look at a difference because fingerprint experts look much closer. So let's, you have another fingerprint of which I have actually large blow-ups. And this blow-up shows interesting features. I mean, it shows, of course, that we have these ridges on these uh, fingerprints, uh, but also that there are other things that are of interest. You have these little islands between fingerprints uh, you have uh, ridges coming together, splitting up again. And you have, on the ridges themselves, you have these little wider spots, which are sweat pores. So these are all features of our fingerprints that all really matter in order to identify fingerprints. I mean, uh, so fingerprints are identical if, if not only if those ridges correspond, but also the islands and so on. So it was important in recognizing fingerprints, not only to get the bigger features, but also very fine scale features. So whenever you are interested in fine scales that are very local, 
and bigger scales that are much less local, wavelets are a good idea. And so that's why wavelets did good work very well. So here on the right, you see that original compressed with a wavelet compression of about factor 15. And here is what, uh, okay, so we have a factor 19 now on the right. And on the left is what you would have had as compression with then the JPEG standard that was then in use. In the meantime, uh, JPEG standards have been able to do better as well, but still not as good as, as wavelets at, at the many different scales. And that's why JPEG 2000 uses wavelets. So, but you see that on the left, you have these islands much less recognizable than uh, on the right. So this is how wavelets made it into the fingerprint standard. Now, uh, let's go back to Van Gogh. And because I'd like to show you uh, uh, shoot. I'd like to show you that presentation. And I thought, I thought I would show you the slides in the language of Van Gogh. <laughs> Actually, uh, so I'll explain them in English, of course. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, uh, which happens to be my mother tongue as well. So that's why, I, uh, which is Dutch. Um, so what, what happened was that the Van Gogh Museum had given us uh, a number of challenges. Because, I mean, we didn't expect, they didn't expect, we didn't expect anything really concretely useful to come out of the workshop. But they wanted to say, they wanted to have our attention focused on a couple of things. And the whole goal of the workshops was actually to start getting conserv conser conserver conserv conservators and art historians interested enough in the image analysis uh, know-how that uh, teams would be formed where people in image analysis and art history would work together. Because it's only by working with people who really have the domain knowledge that you can do interesting stuff. Otherwise, I mean, uh, you go away, you do something, and they say, yeah, but that's not really, what can I do with that? I mean, you have to really be involved with each other, which is something that most applied mathematicians know. I mean, there's a time for doing your math on the side, but there's a lot of time that you have to work with the people who know what they want. Because the one thing when they explain their problem to you is that they don't, it's not mischievous. It's not because they're, they're, there's, there's bad faith, but they don't explain you everything because they don't think of think, explaining you the things that people in their field have learned since kindergarten. I mean, uh, they, they know this. I mean, so typically the way collaboration works is that they explain things to you and you, you make a, a first model and you don't try to do too much because you know at that stage it's not going to be good. And you go back and you say, is this what you meant to say? No! I mean, because, and, and, and then you said, but you didn't tell us that, but everybody knows that. Okay, so you go back. And so after uh, a, co a couple of these times, you understand better, and then you can start really working together and, 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 and refining the thing. But so uh, we were at that earliest stage. But then, and we had given us a challenge. They had given us a whole number of paintings that were by uh, Van Gogh, and some of which are quite atypical, like, I mean, uh, I don't know that many of you would have recognized that, that, that little uh, nude model on, on, on the left and, or, or that Japanese-inspired painting, uh, second from the left at the bottom, uh, uh, as Van Gogh's. But, I mean, he painted many more than only the, 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 the very celebrated paintings. And uh, they also gave us paintings that were by contemporaries, friends of his, or... or uh, 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 the, the, the lady with the black bonnet is actually somebody who was, in a certain sense, a disciple of him, a younger guy with whom he talked a lot uh, in, in, in the final uh, two, three years of his life. And uh, at the right are paintings that at some point were attributed to Van Gogh. Some of these are paintings that well, they just made a mistake because, well, they were in his possession when he died, but they were just swaps he had made with friends. I mean, sometimes painters uh, among friends, they say, oh, I like that one. Oh, and I like this one. Oh, do you want to share? And so he had paintings by others that were not by himself. Uh, some of them, like the flower painting, is by Monticelli, who was an inspiration for him when he was very young. And so some of his early paintings look like, like these Monticellis. And then the one on the bottom left of the group, so the group on the right are the ones that are, no, uh, that are not Van Gogh. The one on the left uh, bottom is a, uh, a, a Wacker forgery. This is a forgery from the, uh, the, the, the 1930s. Somebody in Germany who was an art dealer, a very distinguished art dealer, who um, found a number of, of fantastic Van Goghs, which later turned out to be, uh, well, found not quite an orthodox way. 
so uh, they were they were all fakes. Uh, but at the time, they really they really did fool uh, the, the experts. And so they wanted to, to they wanted to ask us, can you see a difference between Van Gogh's style and other people's style? Can you see a difference between forgeries and true paintings? Which are two different questions. And so what we did is we looked at a wavelet uh, 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 decomposition of the, the paintings. And so here we have what we, what we started with, a decomposition into wavelets of the bedroom painting and how we get details at some scale and, and, and coarse stuff at the other scale and how they are ideal to analyze the brush stroke technique of the painter. So here I've taken a very, very small detail and we look at the wavelet decomposition of that and you see that you, you, you start seeing in, 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 in the wavelet decomposition, you start seeing a graininess uh, that, that will tell you more about the brush strokes. In fact, we used not just the, 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 the horizontal, horizontal, vertical, 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 and vertical, horizontal distinction. We used a more finely tuned direction uh, uh, thing, in it, partly because we wanted to distinguish. You see, if I take the horizontal and vertical difference thing that I did earlier, then diagonals like this are not distinguished from diagonals like that. And I mean, that's not a good idea. I mean, you really, there are, so we wanted to distinguish these directions, and so we used uh, directional wavelets. And uh, so here, let's look at the reconstruction here for uh, the, 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 the little piece of that self-portrait, and you see how I build it up gradually. We could then, having done this with all the paintings and analyzed them mathematically and so on, uh, we could then try to see what features they were in Van Gogh paintings that were typical for Van Gogh and less typical for others. So what type of things? So what we did actually, we, 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 we analyzed uh, how much detail occurred at different layers and we also analyzed locally a kind of hierarchy of detail. You see if you have an edge then you're going to see it at many different scales. We saw that earlier because you have all these fine scale, these, these cores to fine scale wavelet coefficients. When there's just unevenness, you see that at fine scales, but it's washed out at coarse scales. So you can look at these hierarchies through scale. And what we found was that in Van Gogh, there were two transitions uh, that were very, very characteristic for, for many of his paintings at an angle of 75 degrees and at an angle of minus 50 degrees. And in order to, to express that, what I've done is in a, in a piece of the painting that had these features, I'm going to enhance them. And, and so I'll toggle again back and forth so that, that we can. So here in just a little piece on the left, I enhance in the mustache things at 75 degrees. And then uh, on, on the face and on the nose and the cheek, we enhance something at minus 15 degrees. So what I've done here is picked the exact scale at which we found that this, this hierarchical feature was, was important in Van Gogh and not in others. So let's, let's toggle up again. I'll go back and forth a bit of, so that you can try as it blinks to you, you can see what it means. And this was something the art and stories were interested in. They said, oh, wow, never thought of that. So, I mean, I guess later they were looking at 75 and minus 15 angles. And, uh, uh, but uh, so this was a way of, of, of expressing this, that we actually have uh, the, the, the scales at which they, they, their significance emerges. And then, well, we had to compare all these paintings. So we had a good way of, of detect, uh, uh, describing Van Gogh's style compared with the style of other painters by these, 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 uh, these features that stood out. That, 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 uh, but we still had no good way of detecting forgeries, and which, is a very, which we then realized was a very different thing. And uh, we, we, we decided we wanted to see whether we could decide on a distance between paintings. And to do that, I mean, the, 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 the data were given us to the Van, by the Van Gogh Museum in an incredibly fine uh, uh, resolution. I mean, uh, we, we, we had to laugh because they gave them to us in black and white because, well, they didn't know us at the beginning. So uh, museums are very, very careful with their high resolution reproductions because it's in a sense their intellectual property. You can print high quality and very expensive art books if you have that. And they don't really like to have 
competition for their own artworks. So uh, they, g they gave us Van Gogh in black and white, thinking rightly, I think, that nobody would be interested in printing a high quality, art, expensive art book on Van Gogh in black and white. So, uh, uh, but they gave us thumbprints in color. Now the thumbprints were by my standards, very high resolution color images. <laughs> the black and white, of course, had a resolution that was 10 times linearly higher, horizontally and vertically. So there was no way we could treat these as a whole. So we actually had to cut the little image, the, 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 the different pictures into patches, and we would then eat, keep, treat each patch as, a, uh, uh, as, it's, as, as, as an image on itself, and we would compare patches of one painting with all the patches of another painting, and then start with the second patch and compare and so on. And so that way, we actually uh, found, uh, we synthesized this, and we, uh, uh, we, did, we computed a distance between paintings. So uh, distance between the patches, and we added all the distances pairwise for the patches, so we could say, we could define similarity between paintings, I mean, which was only capturing one part, of course, of, of the whole thing. And then we had this similarity, if you have a lot of distances, you can try to make an arrangement in three space that visualizes that, that, that is most faithful to what you have found. And uh, we, we thought of about making a, 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 a little model, I mean, one of these montages that we would rotate, but it was way too much work. So we made a little movie that actually showed that 3 d model. And so I'll try to see whether I've understood how I should do that. So let's look at that movie. Um, oh no, where is it? Ah, here. So, is it coming? It came when we tried it out earlier. Oh no. Oh, sorry. I have this beautiful movie here. And, uh, okay, so what happened is that, uh, why is it not doing it now? Shoot. Okay, I'll try once more and then. Uh, it is? No. Who was? <laughs> I see. Well, I'm not. Uh, it did it beautifully before. I started again, but I tried starting it again before. I mean, uh, okay, I'll start it from scratch again. Okay. Oh shoot, that was not helpful. The problem is, you see that, that that part of this thing, this screen, is not on my. On, on, it's it's here, and I can't reach it with my mouse. Oh, maybe I can move it. No. Ah. This is weird. Okay, I'm sorry. I give up. So, uh, but I can describe to you with my hands. Uh, so. What happened, so we had this, this it's, it's like a little mobile of all these paintings, these little paintings hanging there, and we put a red dot on the paintings that were not by Van Gogh. And uh, if we used one feature in order to distinguish the, the different, uh, different uh, uh, characteristics, we found that Van Gogh paintings had mostly moved outward, but crucially, the, 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 the Wacker painting had not. I mean, it was still fairly close to the center, and that's the one that they really wanted, because the other ones were mistakes that the documentation they realized, but that was the one big forgery. I mean, you really want those to distinguish those. And then if you use two features, those, so the transition's not at 75 and only, but also at 15 degrees, we, uh, the worker was already moving much more outwards. And then later we realized that in fact we could distinguish, and this is an, an, a story with which I will end, because it, it, it has some, uh, it has a little tail that, that stretched into this here. So this first workshop at Van Gogh was, we have had two workshops, and the first one was last year in May. And uh, we wanted to distinguish copies from originals. And we actually had, we were even challenged, I mean, the NOVA, television program NOVA, 
had heard about this and they wanted to make some television out of this. So they actually uh, found a, uh, 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 an art restoration uh, uh, expert and asked her to paint a copy of a Van Gogh, a very little known Van Gogh. And they then gave us, three days before the workshop, they gave us scans of five authentic paintings by Van Gogh that we hadn't known yet, and this one copy. And they challenged us, could we get out the copy? And uh, that's when we realized that the style analysis was not sufficient because they were all of the same style and we could not distinguish them and we were in a panic. Uh, but then we thought about it and we said, look, what do we expect to be a problem with somebody who copies another painting, who doesn't paint in their own style? We expect that it's slower, more hesitant, that you look more. And of course, this is an expert who does it, so uh, we wouldn't look at it, we wouldn't see that with the naked eye, and certainly lay people like ourselves wouldn't see it. But maybe you can see that if you look finely enough. And so we decided to look at very, very, very fine scales and look at whether there was more fine scale information in the copies in one painting than in all the others. And lo and behold, it stood out. It just shone. When you look at fine scales, it was a peak among the other paintings. So we had, I mean, there were three teams that participated last year, and we all three identified, and we were all very happy about this. And we have, I mean, if you go to the NOVA website and you search for it, you have a little video there of the program and showing how happy we were when we found out. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, now, the, that's, it's, I said it has a little tail, because, well, we were scientists. We are scientists after all, and, and when we explained this to art historians, they said, come on, you can't tell me that you can detect this. I mean, it depends on the background, it depends on the fluidity of the paint, it depends on so many things. There's no way you could see it. We said, okay, so we have to, uh, maybe they're right, and maybe we should validate this. So what we actually did is we invited that uh, uh, art restorer person to come to uh, Princeton, uh, for two weeks, and uh, she painted for us uh, a whole lot of little paintings herself in her in, the, in, in, in fluidly in her own style, and then painted copies of her own paintings. So she would take. She actually walked around my house and she found, found all kinds of, of little trotskis, knickknacks, and so on. And so I now have a lot of paintings of my knickknacks. So uh, so she she painted little paintings like that because it was only two weeks and she needed to make something like twenty paintings. So she made little paintings and then. After she'd done the original, the original painting would take her something like 20 minutes or so. She would put aside the subject and she would just copy the painting. And we were putting ourselves in the most difficult situation because we were having a copy made by the person who'd painted the original, <laughs> hours after she'd made the original. I mean, I mean, not, not. And, and so we, we felt if we could detect it there, then people would not be able to, 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 to say much. Uh, I mean, to, 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 to have the same objections anymore. <laughs> And uh, we thought we might because we actually observed and we, we hadn't realized that she said she had expected that, that to paint an original one would take her 20 minutes. Well, to make a copy of the one she had painted in the morning, I mean, copy in the afternoon, would take her something like an hour and a half. I mean, it would take her much longer to, to brush stroke by brush stroke try to, mim to copy exactly what she'd done in the morning. So uh, we, 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 found, we found many things. Um, apart from that, uh, Van Gogh, the Van Gogh Museum, intrigued by what we had done last year, had also given us a new data set in which they gave us some Van Gogh originals and a copy that had been painted and that they, they like a lot because it had been painted at, uh, when, uh, by a contemporary of Van Gogh, by an, an art collector, I mean, uh, shortly after his death, who liked one of the paintings very much. And, uh, but this art collector, being more uh, uh, wealthy than, uh, than Van Gogh, was able to afford better quality pa of paint. In particular, the red that Van Gogh used is red that has faded by now in many of the paintings, because red is a, is a, a color, if you want to buy a stable red, it's expensive. And so the, in the copy, they have much more of the red preserved, because this man could buy better red than Van Gogh could. And so they like this painting, and that's why they, they had it, a negative of it as well, and so on. And so that was scanned in, and they asked us, could we distinguish that this was a copy? We didn't have the original, but we had originals that Van Gogh painted around the same time. And when we tried their first challenge, we, we, we were at a bad, bad, bad shock, because we couldn't. And we said, what's the going on? And then we looked in more detail, and we realized what we hadn't realized before, 
that in the data set they'd given us, the quality of the data was very, very uneven. I mean, some of these, these pictures, these high resolution pictures, were much sharper than others because they had been scanned in. Of course, they didn't scan them in from the painting. You don't take the painting and slam it on the... On the uh, <laughs> I mean, they had very high resolution photographs and they scanned those. And those photographs were very high resolution. But since we were interested in resolution that went way beyond what the art historians typically went, they didn't care uh, uh, that the things were not always as much in focus. Uh, I mean, that they were all of an equal focus because this went beyond what they needed. To them, they were all equal focused, but not to us. And so we realized that depending on when those pictures had been taken, and also which museum, Koller Muller, was much sharper than Amsterdam, we found, uh, that, that, that that affected uh, uh, the, 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 the data. And because the, the forgeries or the copies had been much less in demand, these pictures had been taken much more recently and they were higher quality pictures photographically. And so we had more fine details. So all this fine detail that stood out before, we thought, oh my God, and this was on television. And we went public about this, and this is terrible. So we were really, really glad when we realized this, that we had the data set painted by the art restorer because we would be able to really check we had ground truth there. And it turned out that indeed, but we had to do a much more detailed analysis, analysis than the one we had been so happy about on NOVA last year that our intuition was right. We can indeed, for most media, not for all, because she did it with acrylics and with oils and with oils on very absorbing ground and non-absorbing ground and so on. In most of these circumstances, we could indeed detect which was a copy and not in a reliable way, but it was a more detailed analysis and uh, we were very happy we'd done that because otherwise we would have been, as we say in Dutch, we would have stood in Amsterdam with our mouth full of teeth, met on the mond vol tanden, which means having nothing to say. I mean, uh, but so I think my time is up and uh, I'll stop here with the served over work. Professor Dabashi would be uh, able to answer a few questions if you have any. Any questions? Are there, are there any questions?
that was one of his earliest thoughts, to combine left and, and right images. Do they use wavelets at all for, say, like uh, audio signal processing, like 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 compression into MP3s? Okay, so of... the question is, are wavelets used for audio signal processing, like compression and MP3s? Uh, no. Uh, what in audio, uh, what is used for high quality audio, they use uh, uh, filters. So they did do use. I mean, what you're taking it apart into different uh, bands of information, but those bands have been. Uh, I mean, have been over the years specifically designed exactly for, for that purpose, and they're very finely tuned already to the ear. Uh, in, in audio, it is less important 
to be as localized in, 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 in time because after all these samples Smoother. for high for high quality you sample at a very high uh, frequency for high quality like 44,000 times per, per, per uh, second and so their filters are much longer and so they can afford to do much I mean here we were filters that were used in all the image analysis I was showing you were I mean instead of if I took an average I used two things so I'm using more than two but I've never used more than nine altogether. So it's very, very short. I mean, only you use the professional things. Because audio is, is, audio is very, I mean, what they use is, is, is uh, knowledge about where they can make more mistakes than others. Uh, 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 masking of, of error, error masking, which is, 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 is quite complex. I mean, I, I don't know much about it. I know that it exists. I've talked with people who, who I mean, at Balabs, when I was at Balabs, and the next corridor over, there were people working on this high quality audio. And it was amazing. I mean, they would play these high quality uh, uh, recordings of high quality systems, and they would hear things. I mean, they said, oh, there's an artifact there. I haven't heard anything. I heard perfect sound. I mean, it's, it's they have an incredible ear. Yes? Yes. Okay, so again, the brush was can the analysis be done on what I call painting where the brush stroke isn't as visible? Um, well, I guess that what we would do, what we would find this is, is uh, a different, uh, different features out of it. I mean, in watercolor, what you do have is, is this, this nice sharp edges at, at where, you, at where the, the, the drying started of, of the brush stroke. I expect that would have information. We haven't done that. Yes. Are all of these applications, which are active now, still using uh, your Debussy's wavelet as the principal wavelet? Uh, well, I never followed that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, the, the JPEG 2000 standard uses uh, wavelets that, that uh, uh, were first published in a paper by two co-authors and myself. Uh, uh, the uh, applications which are not of which are higher than the orthonormal wavelengths, if you if come back, if, they, if they're very short, they often use wavelengths that, 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 that I first got. I mean, uh, it, it, where people should, I mean, if people have an application and they know their application well, then we know how they should use what they know about the application to design the best way for that application. I think that's what they should do. I, th I think we should thank uh, the Lobashi again for a very inspiring talk. Thank you very much. And we have extra cards from the lecture if you'd like to come and get one. It's coming out here.